Hi, John. Hey. <laughs> nice to meet you face to face. Yeah, yeah. Going over the notes again, so I got it right. Uh -huh. cool. All the participants are coming in, so we're going to give them just a couple minutes. Uh, yeah. Awesome, you found it. Yeah. So. Cool. Good to hear. Yeah, we. I, I, I see them filtering in real quick, so usually I think we'll give them to about 4.02 and then... Uh, and then get going. But right. in the meantime, they get to be watching us and our beautiful faces right now. Yeah. Are you at the winery or? Yeah, I'm sitting down in the, what used to be the tasting room and is now the Zoom room. <laughs> Zoom room. <laughs> oh gosh. I don't know if you've seen that latest, and I was going around yesterday that the, it's gone viral about this, this uh, virtual court thing that was going on with the judge and two lawyers and one of the lawyers had the cat filter on and couldn't get it off. Yeah. No, yeah. I was th I was thinking I needed to put one of the lobster lo lo a lobster find find something appropriate for 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 yeah, yeah. Pretty funny. So yeah, one of my sisters used to work in the core system and they they think that's this is the greatest thing. So anyhow. yeah. And it is amazing how uh, I think uh, my assistant got a copy of that sent to him two days ago from Australia. And then the next day was all over everywhere. Yeah. So obviously yeah. it does, doesn't take long for info no. to disseminate. Yeah. Cool. Well, it looks like they're still filtering in and we're getting close to uh, 402. So uh, yeah, I've yeah, got, uh, got a big crew on board. Uh, so we'll get going. Let me see if I can pull this down a little bit more. And when we do the shucking demo, I'll kind of mess around with this. I've done this before with the screen and trying to get my hands in there and all that. <laughs> Learning how to do this. Sounds good. Well, cool. I just wanted to say uh, first, thank you to everybody. Uh, this, uh, my name is Aaron Weinkoff. I'm the winemaker vineyard manager here at Spotswood Winery. And I'm here with uh, John Finger from uh, Hog Island Oyster. And uh, looking forward to uh, what I hope, and I'm super curious about uh, just being a, a good conversation because the, the whole idea of, of course, of how this all came together of, of both of us uh, discovering we were, each other was, was B Corp certified. And of yeah. course, we were very familiar already with each other's products. Uh, we've worked with the Hog Island Oysters a number of times at a number of events. And, and of course, uh, we found out you, of course, were familiar with the wine. So we were just super excited to put this together and uh, hope everybody enjoys. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is John Finger. I'm the uh, founder 38 years ago of uh, Hog Island Oyster Company and, and uh, our current CEO. And, and I'm really looking forward to this as well. It should be fun. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and, and as I had just mentioned, you know, we, we, we both kind of came across this through a, a B Corp in introduction. Um, we both have pursued B Corp and are B Corp certified now. And this is, of course, something that's just very, very important to us as companies. Um, for those who don't know B Corp, well, you want to share. You you probably uh, you probably are even more familiar with it than I am. So yeah, so we you know B Corp is short for Benefit Corporation, and uh, it's basically a movement to to uh, talk about corporations. Be, you know, this there's, there's always this thing. And a lot of it's a myth about, you know, business being bad, environment being good, or communities, this kind of thing. And just realizing that there's those of us who have been practicing business for a long time in a way that, you know, like our motto is, 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 is you know, business the right way. Like doing the right thing is good business. And this move, movement is about certifying companies, you know, gaining recognition for companies who are doing the right thing for the environment, for their communities, for their employees, for all their stakeholders. And uh, we are in certain states, you actually can have a legal entity that is, and we are actually, Hog Island is actually a legal, what is called a benefit corporation in California. So, which means our, our articles and bylaws address some of those very issues that we have to make decisions based on a number of factors, not just, you know, what is the best thing for our shareholders. So. Um, it's been a been a long journey, and it and it's um, you know the, the the certification process itself is is sometimes arduous. A lot of it is documenting things you already do, but um, you know we've been really 
uh, excited to become part of that community. Yeah, and as I understand it, some of those other entities, of course, are you know how we how we care for our employees, how we care for our communities, and of course how we care for our environment. So putting those things uh, at the heart of what we do as as business entities is. Uh, is 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 vital and that kind of leads us to well first of all first of all sorry i forgot to do the uh the traditional <laughs> yeah come on cheers nice to see you uh it'll be good to enjoy some uh some of the uh, 2019 sv and then uh we of course have some of your oysters here yeah so good. if you uh yeah i don't know if you want to start us out i know What's in the glass, as I said, is 2019 SB. Um, we always love how SB, uh, our Sauvignon Blanc specifically, but oftentimes lots of Sauvignon Blanc um, pairs with oysters just because we love the balance of the brininess, the minerality from, from, from the shell, and then, of course, the fattiness from the meat uh, of the oyster. And then on the uh, the same side, uh, there's the the, the brininess, uh, the acidity uh, of the Sauvignon Blanc, and, and of course the the richness and texture of it. And so the two just really dance together, oftentimes. So so I'm pretty excited, and I know you wanted to share a few things also about. Yeah, that. yeah. I just when I was talking to Aaron earlier about this, getting ready for this, um, it reminded me of. Um, uh, uh, something that Ernest Hemingway wrote. I don't know if people are familiar with this book, if they can see this, A Movable Feast by Ernest Hemingway. And he talks about um, a certain day um, where he had just finished writing a story and how that often made him both empty and sad. Um, and so he had asked the, the waiter for a dozen oysters and a half craft of the dry white wine they had there. So I thought this would be a great introduction for today. So. As I ate the oysters with their strong taste of the sea and their faint metallic taste that the cold white wine washed away, leaving only the sea taste and the succulent texture. And as I drank their cold liquid from each shell and washed it down with the crisp taste of wine, I lost the empty feeling and began to be happy and to make plans. And I just thought it was just a great, great kickoff to, to, to this little tasting. So anyhow. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I always love a Hemingway reference. Yeah. So. Well, cool. Well, you want to start us out? I know uh, just uh, the wine bottle, uh, you know, it's like uh, like flying on the plane. You know, we you, hopefully we don't need too many directions on how to put on our seatbelt. <laughs> but uh, but uh, hopefully everybody who, who can join us has their bottles open and, uh, and would love to have you uh, take us through a quick little shucking demonstration. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and move my screen here. Tried to do this a couple of times. Everybody can see my my plate of oysters ready to be shucked there. Um, so first thing is having a good tool. Um, this is the one I use the most of. It's it's basically you want something with it with a, a stiff enough blade because you're going to be doing some prying that you're not going to. Um, I'm going to move this back up again for a second so I can do this up here again. You know, a, a, a blade that that pointed so you can go into the the oyster here but something that's stiff enough. There's a few different varieties. This is one I picked up in France a few years ago for smaller oysters, it's really good. Um, this is one that's a little bit stronger, stouter. So depending on the oyster you're opening, we actually use different knives, depending on if it's a thick shelled oyster, older oyster, younger, smaller oyster. So, um, but really what you're after is every oyster um, has a cup side and a flat side. So hope everybody can see that there. So this is our, our hog on sweet water, our Pacific oyster, which is the main one we grow. And you can see that there's a flat side here and a cup side. And you can also see that there's a pointed end here. All right, that's the hinge. So an oyster keeps itself closed. Hang on, I'm gonna move this down by two points. So if you're looking at the top of the oyster, there's the hinge here, there's a ligament. And then two thirds of the way on the right is a muscle. And those are the two places we're gonna attack. So, you know, we do this in the restaurant with a glove and a knife and up in the air like this. Um, I don't recommend you do that unless you're very proficient so you don't stab yourself in the hand. So at home, what we recommend is wadding up a towel, okay? Can everybody see that okay? Aaron, is that okay? Yeah, so far so good. So we're gonna place the oyster down on the wadded up towel um, just to stabilize it. And the, the glove, when we use a glove, the glove isn't going to stop you from stabbing yourself, but it's just getting a good grip on the sharp 
shell into the oyster. So, but in this case, we're going to use um, the towel, and you're going to start by inserting the knife into the hinge here. Okay. And when I show people this, if the plane of the hinge is like this, you want to be down into the into the cup of the oyster a bit, right? And what you're doing is actually not forcing the knife into the oyster, but you're almost backing the oyster onto the knife. At the same time, you do a little back and forth motion. And as soon as you feel the tip engage, I'm gonna pull this up here a little bit. As you pull the tip engage there, um, you're gonna start prying back and forth, right? Pop, you feel that pop? That's the hinge going right there, okay? And then what you're gonna do is I usually pry up a little bit to, to create a little space there. And now if you, anybody has filleted a fish, what you want to do next is keeping the, that knife against the top shell like you're filleting a fish against the bone. We're going to reach across for that muscle that's over here, okay, and take the flat shell off, okay? And the idea is, is that you've not left a lot of meat on the, on the top shell and you haven't made this look like scrambled eggs, okay? A <laughs> common mistake is people, when they're pressing in this way, the knife goes all the way in, and then they start trying to work their way towards the muscle. That's the best way to make the oyster look like scrambled eggs. If the knife does happen to go all the way in, pull it back out. So just the tip is engaged, right? Pry up and then you're sliding against that top shell, and removing it, okay? Then we're gonna come back and go underneath that muscle like this or this way. You can come in either, either way, whichever is more comfortable and loosen that muscle. Now, you want to look around to see if you've gotten any shell in here in the hinge or any fragments of shell over there. And if you haven't, you're good to go. Okay. So now hopefully what you've done is shucked an oyster and looks like the top shell came off and didn't disturb your oyster meat at all. And Aaron's going ahead and eating oysters. Honestly. Yeah, sorry. He couldn't wait. Yeah, so. Been... <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people, you know, back in the old day, you'd hear a lot of people say, well, you need to rinse the the water out and do all that. You really don't need to do that if the oysters have been grown in, in a clean place. You actually, in a, a lot of places in France, they pour this liquid out as a way of seeing if the oyster is fresh, because if the oyster is fresh, it'll expel more liquid, it create liquid. If it doesn't expel more liquid, it's not fresh. But either way, now you have the oyster with a little bit of the, what we call the liquor in there, which is the seawater it was growing in, and I recommend either doing it plain or just a little bit of lemon to really taste the flavor of the oyster. You know, we're known for this sauce here called hogwash, which is a rice vinegar based mignonette. But right now I'm just gonna do squeeze a little lemon on, right? And the pro way to do this, if you don't have an oyster fork, I'm gonna show you here, is you pick it up by the, the hinge end with your thumb and your middle finger, leave your index finger free to give the meat a little push off. Right? Mm -mm -mm. Sorry. And, as, and as, Ernest, as Ernest says, you wash the oyster down. Ah. Very good. Well, sorry for that few, those, those few moments of self-indulgence too on my part, but. <laughs> They're sitting here. We gotta, we gotta enjoy them. It is a good combination, that's for sure. So, well, I love hearing the story about the uh, about the water in the shell because, of course, that that brings us to really the the focus of of what our conversation is, and it's 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 where we grow, it's how we grow, it, it what's it's what it's the it's what really breeds the essence of, of what we're doing. And I know yeah. I was really fascinating because I had not actually heard the, the word meroir before. Of course, you know, we talk about terroir all of the time. And and so I was I was I was very much looking forward to asking you about the uh, meroir and and how how you see it because I know you know on our side we talk about terroir and oftentimes some people like to refer to the soils uh, obviously terre yeah. being, being uh, key to, to that but so oftentimes it goes so much beyond that I mean it's 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 the combination of the people around it's the combination of of the air it's it's the climate it's the seasonality of it um oh yeah 
and the diversity of it that creates that terroir on a, a cumulative basis. Uh, and so I was, as I was thinking about what in the world terroir was, I, I was, I was going, going through all of the different facets of what we deal with and thinking like, wow, you guys have a very different world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's funny. It's different, but it's there's so many similarities, analogies with 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 wine and, and oysters because it really is about. I mean, I talk about this all the time, and I think oysters are, are probably more about place than any other food you could think of because we're not feeding and fertilizing, manipulating what they're what they're experiencing from the environment. So, one of the other things I'm fond of saying is, you know, seventy five percent of this business is site selection, and yeah. I'm sure that's a lot like that in 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 wine too, knowing what's good. And so, you know, for instance, you have bays all over the world that, that are salt water, right? But yeah. that salt water is different in different parts of the world. And even, especially in bays, um, depending on, on the surrounding landscape, um, or even the seasonality as you, as you mentioned. So, so even the, that brininess and saltiness comes of course, from the ocean, of course, but then there's the interaction with how much fresh water is coming off of the land. And then also the, the minerality has to do with, well, what kind of minerals are in that, that bay as opposed to another bay? Because if you have uh, sedimentary rock forms or granitic rock forms, or you have forested hills or all these kinds of things can play into just sort of the whole mineral complex that's in the bay. And then the other big issue with, with, uh, with shellfish and oysters is that they're, they're primary grazers. They're grazing microscopic algae in the seawater, right? But that microscopic algae is not just one type of microscopic algae. It's a whole range of, of green algae, browns, reds, and in different bays, that's a different mix. And those algae have different lipid and, and, and carbohydrate concentrations. So that will affect the flavor of the oyster as well. So um, I even can taste the difference when you get practice between the north end of Tamales Bay and the south end of Tamales Bay, because there's different algae blooming at any given time. So you can really key in on those things. So, And, and how much of that is something, are, you know, are you guys actually tracking that or is that something that you, you know about, uh, you know, you, you loosely know that uh, a certain temperature or certain composition might favor one algae or another and, and that's how you go about your site selection and do you monitor it or you know once once as you said kind of once 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 the uh once the tables are in the water you, yeah you're, yeah you're there and you're doing it yeah it's interesting I, I wish we were that technically adept to tell you the truth but i think a lot of it's been trial and error over the error over the years I mean, now it's funny, but I think we've caught up with that. We do a lot of plankton toes and, and uh, we get to see what kind of algae is in the water in different places at different times of the year. But in the beginning, it was about um, first and foremost, our first, so we have 160 acres that we farm on in Tamales Bay, but we started with five acres and we hand picked and surveyed that five acres because it was near the mouth of the bay, had good exchange with the ocean, but enough residence time that you get some sunlight in the water, building up the algae blooms, which you need. So, um, but over the years, as we picked up other areas in the bay, we noticed differences at different times of the year, um, and didn't exactly know why. But we knew, for for instance, at the south end of the bay, um, oysters were a little bit better, a little bit plumper in in late spring than they were at the north end of the bay. Those kinds of differences, or seed did better. The young oysters did better in certain parts of the bay than other parts of the bay. Or, you know, we did, we grow different varieties of oysters. So different varieties seem to do better in different parts of the bay. And part of that might be salinity. Part of it might be more favorable algae for that species of oyster versus another species. So um, we've just learned that over the year. And then, you know, each bay is going to be a little different. So you really do have to have to take your time and go through a number of seasons to start to get the rhythm of a place. So... And, and how much of that is tied to uh, temperature, basically? Uh, I, you know, I'm, I, I really, as I was thinking about it, I just kept having these visions that the, the world in which you deal with um, is in many ways very similar to the world in which we deal with. But, uh, you know, 
exponentially expanded just in the sense that you know when you guys are talking about tens of degrees of shift or 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 some of the other things that happen on a on an oceanic level um you know we might be talking about 10 or 15 degrees and i was kind of curious how you guys how you guys look at that right now in, in terms of changing conditions and stuff changing conditions but just you know just monitoring temperatures yeah. like what what oh, yeah. are the things you guys focus on yeah, so we do. I mean, temperature is a big one, actually. So it, it, it's uh, for, for two reasons. I mean, one, it changes the condition of the oysters. So all oysters in the northern hemisphere, and we grow different varieties. We grow five different varieties at any point in time. The, the Pacific oyster, which is our hog on sweetwater, is the main one we grow, and everybody on the West Coast grows. But part of the reason we grow different varieties, other than trying to make sure we're, we're being resilient, is that they have different rhythms throughout the year do in most part to, to water temperatures. So um, I mentioned the different leases we have in the bay. Um, our southernmost most lease, which is further from the mouth of the bay, you know, typically in the summertime, you know, two things happen. It gets um, over 70 degrees Fahrenheit on a regular basis, which can make Pacific oysters a little fatter and softer in texture. Mm -hmm. um, and then they also, the, the oysters tend to grow a lot faster right, which you kind of think in the, on the outset is a good thing, but actually when, when things are growing faster, they're more susceptible to stressors. Yep. So you have to be really careful about, about that. And then in addition, down at the south end of the bay, something we learned over the years is um, in a, if, if the air temperature is getting hotter due to evaporation, the water can actually get saltier than the ocean. It can be hypersaline. So we don't harvest anything from that end of the bay in the summertime. We actually don't put seed down there in the summertime. We use that area very seasonally compared to some of our other areas. And so we'll monitor water temperatures at the four different areas we grow in. And we'll switch where we're harvesting at any given point of the year based on what we think are the most favorable conditions. You know, that's how we're able to have good oysters year round because we're really watching that. And we have four areas that are different than from each other. Yeah, I'll, I'll again show my ignorance. What what is what what is the lifespan from from when you're seeding to when you're harvesting? Uh, so an extra small oyster, which is I believe is what everybody got sent to them, is is basically from um, from larvae, which is the 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 very beginning of an oyster. And, and to do a, a brief history of, of life history of oysters, oysters start off as free swimming larvae. They're they. Most oysters release eggs and sperm out into the water column. They mix, they form the larvae, they're free swimming for 10 days to two weeks. They're, they then lose the ability to swim, fall out of the water column and um, cement themselves as something and start forming shells. From that point on, they don't, they're, they're pulling calcium carbonate out of the water and they're, they're don't, they don't move. So from the larvae time, from the time we create that larvae to that extra small that we're all eating now, it is about one and a half years, you know, a year and three months, year and six months, somewhere in there for the extra small. We could grow oysters faster than that if we wanted to, but you don't get as good a quality. That's the other thing you learn. I mean, you get out of college and you think fast growth is good growth, right? You're turning your equipment over fast or all this good stuff, but it doesn't cr create the quality that we want uh, for two reasons. One, we're selling oysters live in the shell. So shell quality matters. So Forcing the oyster to be out of the water every day, tumbling them around, puts energy into, into shell quality. And then every place we believe the oyster reaches a peak at a certain time. And for that extra small oyster, it's at about at that year and a half period where, I mean, I could grow an oyster this big in Tamales Bay in, in nine to 10 months, but you could crack it in half with your hands and the meat quality just doesn't develop. So, so anyhow, so it's about that, that year and three months, year and six months, but the bigger oysters might take a little bit longer. The other varieties we grow, we grow some of the Eastern or Atlantic oyster and the Kumamoto. Those are two year plus crops for us. Okay. So. Yeah, it is, it is fun listening to, <laughs> to you talk about it because it, it is amazing how many, how many different parallels. I mean, whether you're talking about, you know, not wanting things to grow fa too fast, you know, we, yeah. we see that probably, you know, on one hand, most, apparently and, and and something that probably everybody could identify with it you know in in barrel selection oak stave selection 
where you just can't afford to have your trees growing too fast because uh, you know they're just they're 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 too porous and and then the complexity that is developed from a much more slow growing um, tree and I think you see that you know we see that also in you know how we how we raise the vines I mean obviously it's a little bit different because we're dealing with something that's a a perennial that you know it it, it plants its it plants its it plants its feet in the ground and it doesn't yeah. go anywhere for you know, hopefully 45 to 100 years uh, and it draws all of its cues from 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 the atmosphere and but just thinking about how yeah you you don't you don't want to push it too fast because they 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 lose the the connective tissue they they lose their balance points the you don't want to you don't want to push things too much with just um you know a, a, a generic uh, processed nitrogen fertilizer because it is not a um i think about it too and kind of in terms like we do with our bodies you just don't want to give yourself processed foods all of the time because it's ultimately too too synthetic. It's not. Uh, it's it's neither nutrient rich and dynamic, right. and it and it's not um, it's not uh, energetically enriched either. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think one of the interesting things, and this is something a newer lesson I've learned after thirty eight years in business and a few years before that working for other people. So when when people ask me about oyster flavor. You know, I use the wine analogy a lot. I go, first and foremost is the variety. You know, we talked earlier about the different um, types of phytoplankton are in a bay. Well, our Pacific or, you know, our Hagan Sweetwater grown side by side with our Kumamoto and our Atlantic will taste different because they uptake minerals differently and they select for different phytoplankton. So just like wine, it's the variety that really is the primary thing. And then behind that is the miroir, right? Is, is where they're grown will influence the flavor. A Pacific oyster from one bay is gonna taste different than another bay. And then I used to always say that the hand of the farmer had a very small influence on, on the oyster flavor. It was really about the initial site selection, unless somebody's really doing a bad job versus a really good job. But we have a, a newer technique that we're developing. And some people up in the Pacific Northwest are already doing it, creating what are called tumbled oysters. Oysters that are grown in bags that have a float attached to so that tumble every tide cycle, right? Oh, wow. And um, we did that with our seed for years, but we didn't finish our oysters that way. And the guys who were doing it up north, they did it for a couple of reasons. One, it, it slowed the oysters down a little bit more, creates a more uniform oyster where all the oysters are more the same size, and it, and it develops a really good deep cup shell and a thick shell. But what they also started discovering is it seemed to change the meat quality as well in the oyster. So um, oysters grown side by side on the bottom versus those oysters tasted differently and, and had a complexity that, that was different. And so we tried a little bit on one of our areas where we weren't able to grow good oysters for many years. They were always thin and voila, we're growing this beautiful oyster. So I talked to some of our scientists about it. And essentially the theory is much like wine. If you're stressed the oysters a little bit, like you're stressing the vines a little bit, you force the oysters to put some energy into reserves, which is the complex glycogen-based flavor that's coming through. So after 30 some odd years, I learned something new. So, so it is just like wine. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really is is fascinating just hearing you talk about it because yeah, we see it we see it in 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 varietal selection. We see it in where varietals are grown. You know, we 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 here at, at Spasswood, we, we're not growing Merlot um, or Malbec right here on our own property. We've always just identified the other varietals to do better. You know, we, we do a lot as far as uh, rootstock selection and, and creating, you know, within our sense of our monoculture that we are with just being grape growers, having that diversity built into it. Uh, where we have, you know, we have seven primary rootstocks and over 20 uh, rootstocks that are at different stages of uh, growth, investigation, and trialing. Yeah. And it's just, uh, yeah, you, you realize that bringing in that complexity, bringing in that diversity, and, and everything that we do to enhance the, uh, the ecosystem within the concept of what we're doing as, as farming very specific products is, uh, is quite, uh, it, it's quite cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. Well, 
you know, along along those lines, I mean, you, you, you've touched a lot on the, the diversity of what you guys are growing. Um, within that idea, are there other things that you guys are doing for the sustainability of, of what you're doing? Um, and how do you continue to, to carry this forward? Yeah, well, it's interesting. So we, we um, you know, one of the things you know, talking about the whole B Corp certification was was to, to us it was just a natural progression because the the DNA and our DNA of our company is based on, of course, environmental sustainability. We've gotten involved in a lot of efforts to make sure the watershed around our bay are taken care of because that that matters for us in the long long term. You know, and so that was always sort of baked in. And then as we grew over the years. You know, we felt we had always kind of created something that was a fun place to work and people like being here. We have a lot of long term employees, but then just being more conscious about that and building things into our culture and, and, and how we get involved in our community and all those kinds of things. So, um, you know, we, we um, started facing that direction of like, okay, well, how do we do better and what parts of our, our operation can we um, do a better job in, for instance. So uh, one of the things is, is, you know, like I mentioned, we grow this product that that um, we don't have to feed or fertilize. You know, this, the, when I talk about sustainability, I talk about two things. I talk about inputs, which we get to grow these great oysters without putting a lot of inputs in, um, whether it's whether it's feed or fertilizer or fresh water, and we're growing this great animal protein. And then there's biodiversity, and because we're Depending on water flow, there's lots of biodiversity. There's seaweeds growing on our bags that we're looking at harvesting now. There's other critters that grow grow in there that oysters form natural reefs. But you know, on the land side, you know, we we pump seawater around, we chill the seawater down in our filtered seawater tanks. We use a lot of energy. So a few few years back, we um, invested and in, put a, a 206 solar panels on our facility in Marshall. So we're offsetting 85% of our power usage in Marshall. Um, we're constantly taking a look at our, our, our truck fleet in terms of, of, of how uh, efficient we are in terms of moving things around. You know, we, we make a concerted effort and we're lucky, we're in the Bay Area. We can sell everything we grow locally if we wanted to. Um, but years ago, we made a concerted effort to say, look, we can sell almost, and, you know, almost everything we grow locally and that makes a big, big difference. You know, we're turning our attention now towards our restaurants, you know, I don't know if everybody on the call knows this, but we have five um, locations in the Bay Area. And so now we're really looking at, okay, well, what's our energy usage and water usage like in our restaurants? You know, can we do a better job per serving, you know, in terms of how we're running it? How are we, how are we doing on food waste? All those kinds of things. So um, as you know, the whole B Corp movement is about constantly improving, right? So, like, okay, here we are today, but where can we get to tomorrow? So that's, kind of our, our look ahead on that. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I mean, we, we find ourselves in a very similar way. We, we started, you know, we started farming organically in 1985 before organics was even really a, a buzzword. And then by 1992, the actual certification agency showed up. And so we took advantage and, and certified. And so we've been farming organically ever since then. And, and then, you know, that ethos just carries into, you know, how do we restore the, the natural riparian areas uh, around us? You know, how do we incorporate uh, the, the insectaries? How do we make sure that, uh, you know, all our seasonal creeks that are attached to us that are carrying water down to the bays, um, you know, are, are, are protected uh, both from just normal erosion um, as well as anything that we might be doing ourselves. And of course, all of those efforts to to farm to farm organically just again feeds into the the same the same ethos that we ultimately identified as part yeah. of before and why why it really called uh, called to us. Um, and of course, now as we're starting to face climate change and some of these other aspects of how our practices are changing it is absolutely forcing us to consider everything and you know being in a position the position where we're at 
we feel that you know it's absolutely necessary that we we basically take a position on the forefront of that and and hopefully yeah. lead, lead by example which again i think is is part of what b corp is but you know how how that mm, permutates throughout and how we again start evaluating what we're doing as far as you know having moved everything ourselves to solar back in 2007 um, and you know how we continue to evaluate um, any of our waste products how we continue to reduce our fuel consumption both in our farming practices as well as just our daily lives because we realize that yeah like you guys in the restaurants you know it, it's us and how we ship wine around and how we are able to move those do those things that really contributes to our ultimate footprint oh yeah so we i was just uh, talking to someone earlier about about this that i really do you know something we we strongly believe in that you know how we we the collective we choose to produce food going into the future is really going to make a big big difference we we um you know speaking of climate change you know we um we're a founding member, Hog Island is, of what's called the Shellfish Growers Climate Coalition. Because we think we have a sort of unique perspective on this, that we actually are already seeing the effects of too much CO2 in the atmosphere. We're seeing it in our oceans and our bays. And yet we're business people as well. And we think, you know, we, we need to let people know that this isn't a theoretical thing. This is actually happening. Um, and, you know, how, are, the, how exactly are you seeing it? And what are you guys doing about it? So so the, the interesting thing is when you when you early days when this was first coming up and if people watch the movie, The Inconvenient Truth, you know, the, the, when I saw that, and again, I have a science background, seeing the CO2 graph in that movie was like, oh shit, you know, we, because I knew what that meant. And what we're seeing already is a lot of that CO2 winds up on our oceans. And it's a little complicated chemical equation. A lot of the older, the, the beauty of the West Coast and the upwelling that we see is a lot of that water is very nutrient rich, yeah. right? Because it's it's been it's cool. circulating on the bottom of the ocean and then get the wind happens off the West Coast and the upwelling happens and it's nutrient rich. That water is also very, tends to be acidic, which is not a very good thing, but it would always mix with the surface water so that you had good conditions for, for shell forming creatures. Remember earlier I talked about calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is what all shell forming creatures need to be able to form their shells. So, but what's happening now is because there's so much CO2 in the atmosphere, the, the acidity is going up of the surface water. So that mixing that used to take place that would mitigate that isn't happening as regularly. And so what happens is sometimes you have a, a pH dropping, which is more acidity. And when that happens, calcium carbonate gets harder to grab out of the seawater for the, for the shell forming creatures. So especially the very young, young oysters, which need calcium carbonate to start forming their first shells, start to struggling. And we actually started seeing this on the West Coast in some of the hatcheries up in the Pacific Northwest about 10, 10 to 12 years ago and going, why, why is this happening? And so we actually, as a company, you know, one got involved in this in this in this climate coalition of shellfish growers to try to get the message out. But we actually have built and started a hatchery up in Humboldt Bay, because a biologist, what you get concerned about is not necessarily the absolute change, but is the rate of change, right? And the rate of change is what is so concerning that the animals can't evolve fast enough. So we're hoping through some genetic selection to start breeding animals that can handle the changing ocean conditions that we're already seeing. And the other thing that we're doing is we're collaborating with a lot of researchers on the West Coast where we have instrumentation at our facility in Marshall and up in Humboldt Bay to monitor ocean chemistry real time to learn a little bit more about how does a more acidic ocean interact when you get into a bay and what can we do operationally to buffer the seawater. Some of it is, 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 has to do with seaweed. Some of it can be buffering with shell. So trying to learn different techniques to sort of mitigate what we're already seeing. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, on, on our end, it becomes, it, it just, it, it feels so much more apparent when we're just, we're faced with, uh, you know, windows of 117 degrees or yeah. 10 consecutive days over 100 degrees and, and va VPDs, vapor pressure deficits, where we've never seen that combination of lack of humidity and right. temperatures as high for such sustain, sustained periods. That, that really drive just ultimately stuff that can be just 
devastating periods in which to try to try to farm and, and grow. Well, well, yeah, I mean, we, we some, see some of that effect is, uh, too with, you know, increased water temperatures. Um, the other thing is, is the, the rainfall patterns, you know, getting these major large storms where all the rain comes in a short period of time is, is, is really difficult for us to manage around. It really, um, I mean, affects our ability to harvest and all sorts of things. So, yeah, or, 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 or not even enough water. No, no, no water at all. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, we deal with the same thing, you know, constantly evaluating the tools that we have, whether it's, uh, you know, questioning and evaluating varietals that we're growing, working with rootstocks, you know, constantly trying to monitor our irrigation systems and modify it just so we're squeezing out every bit of efficiency from these yeah, that, yeah. That, that we can. Um, yeah, because with without them, you know, those 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 lifelines uh, become pretty frail. Yeah, we've been, you know, like I said, we grow different varieties, so we want to be resilient against possible diseases, but also conditions and, and monitoring. Like Kumamoto's are a little bit better at adept at handling the higher water temperatures. Um, we're also starting a farm up in Humboldt Bay, in addition to the hatchery and nursery we have there, to have a farm in another bay because we, again, we're trying to look at long-term res resiliency. So. Yep. Yep. Well, I know I failed to mention it earlier, but uh, we, we have had a handful of uh, questions coming in. So I might uh, sneak over and just see if there's any that yeah. I might be able to address quickly. And sorry if it'll take me a second. Um, one person did ask uh, when you guys uh, received your B Corp certification. Oh boy, I think it was 2015. We've been through one renewal already. Awesome. Uh, and have another one coming up, yeah. Good for you. Well, and yes, we, we obviously had the, uh, the privilege to join that group just this year. All right. Or just, well, sorry, technically the end of last year, with, within this past year. Yeah. Um, yep. Um, sorry, as I tried to utilize my, my mouse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one question that mm, I don't think we fully addressed was just the differences between West Coast and East Coast oysters, uh, i.e. like uh, Massachusetts or Maine oysters. Yeah, great. It's a great question. So I, I mentioned earlier, so, you know, people ask me if I have an oyster somewhere, how do I remember to ask something about how, how you know, to get something similar. So the two things to remember are the variety and the place or the miroir. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we are one of the few farms on the, on the West Coast that actually grows the East Coast variety. A lot of people don't know, know this, but this is a great nerdy oyster factoid to remember if you want to remember this. So on the West Coast, our native oyster is the Olympia oyster, which is a very small, slow growing oyster that was essentially wiped out in, in gold rush times and in post gold rush. And so in 1873, when the Transcontinental Railroad got completed, somebody decided to bring East Coast oysters out here to grow. And they brought small ones out to be able to put in to San Francisco Bay and Tomales Bay and one bay in Washington to, to grow them out to market size. So um, if anybody knows about Jack London, I'm sure a few of you know, Jack London, if you know that, was an oyster pirate as a teenager on San Francisco Bay. Well, he was actually pirating the East Coast oyster grown in San Francisco Bay. So that's the, the, the super nerdy oyster factoid for the day. So um, anyhow, so the East Coast oyster um, tends to be a little bit slower growing and it, it's not as um, fecund, which means it doesn't put as much energy in, into creating eggs or sperm so when oysters aren't doing that, that energy gets into that, that meatiness, that, that glycogen-based sort of, um, some people might say sort of fatty or texture flavor. East Coast oysters tend to reflect a little bit more minerality than the, than the West Coast. You, the West Coast oysters tend to have, I don't know, stronger is the right word. There's a little bit more complexity there, whereas the East Coast oysters will take on a little bit more minerality, brininess, uh, uh, vegetal aspects. Um, would be the, the way I would describe it. So our hog on Atlantic grown side by side to our Pacific, we'll, you'll taste that. You'll taste more minerality. You'll taste more um, brine with it than you will with our, our Pacific oyster. Um, other than that, a lot of the East Coast oysters 
reflect the miroir of the East Coast bays. And a lot of East Coast bays are less saline than our bays. Most of our bays on the West Coast are essentially for most of the year, the same salinity as the ocean. That's not the case on the East Coast because of the, the topography there. A lot of the bays on the East Coast, so for instance, ocean salinity is around 35 parts per thousand, right? Our bay here maybe gets down to 28 parts per thousand that a lot of the East Coast bays are half of that. They're 13, 15, 20 parts per thousand. So they have a lot more freshwater influence to them. So that's gonna drastically in, in, impact that flavor. My guess is that has something to do with when you look at the map of the United States and you see the Mississippi, how it looks pretty green to the right and the looks yeah, yeah, yeah. To the left of it. Well, it's just sort of low lying coastal plain that kind of goes out and, and a lot of water, fresh water seeps going out into the bays back east. So, yep. Cool. Well, this one, I, this is a one fun question I think really rings true to, to both you and what you were talking about and us and how we, you know, utilize, uh, fertilizers, composts, et cetera. But it says uh, everybody knows how to recycle a wine bottle, but uh, what can you do with an oyster shell? <laughs> it's really interesting. They're great in compost, actually. We, we have a ranch that we've been playing around with creating a compost with, you know, chopped up oyster shells, seaweed, <clears throat> you know, and other, other ingredients. Um, a lot of people, you know, if you have chickens, I mean, that's the main ingredient. If you go buy, you know, chicken scratch, you know, that's, that's yeah, there you go. Or crush it for your bocce ball court. That's the best actually thing they use them for. So, I mean, all of those things are great. You know, we, we stockpile quite a bit of it there. There are some methods in the Bay Area on the East Coast, they have done some shell recycling programs because they're trying to replace some of the natural reefs that existed. Um, there are a few people around here who are trying to, to increase the numbers of native oysters in San Francisco Bay um, the, and, and to do a shell collection program at restaurants. Um, the problem is you need to age that shell. You don't want to put it directly back into the bay and they're still working on where's the place to do that and, and uh, how to collect the shell and do all that kind of thing. So, but they're all the, all those good uses for oyster shell. Are Paving, they still Pavings, yeah, I grew up on the East Coast and we all had oyster and clamshell driveways. So. Yeah, are, are there, oh, that's pretty funny. Are there still, uh, you were talking about the, the history of a lot of the, the native oyster populations dying off uh, following the gold rush. Are there still quite a few native oysters or were they really completely supplanted by, by the implants? No, 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 not at all. They, they, they um, you know, are the, the oysters that we grow, the non-natives that we grow don't really reproduce and, 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 and establish very well around our area. They do in some areas in Washington state and British yeah. Columbia, but um, the native oyster, you know, we've been part of efforts. There are some in Tamales Bay. There are some in San Francisco Bay and, and uh, even further south in Elkhorn Slough down by um, in the Monterey Bay area. But um, a lot of them have been affected by just changes over time because of land use practices. So they used to form what are called low fringing reefs, which are just around the edges of a bay where there's clean, hard, rocky substrate. Yep. But with a lot of siltation over the years, that has gotten buried. So they don't have a lot of suitable habitat, yep. which is what a lot of these restoration efforts are trying to, to bring back is can we create the suitable substrate for them to settle on? The other piece is that the hydrology of a lot of our bays have changed. The freshwater inputs are severely curtailed, which they used to count on. So like I said, we, we are part of efforts to, to kind of see if we can establish at least a, a, a baseline population in a lot of these bays so we'll, we'll see yeah we've we certainly see that just in the restoration working on uh, all of the work we've done to to restore you know the creek bed that we have here running alongside the the vineyard you know this was something that uh, you know army corps of engineers went back through and you don't want to make it really nice and clean they harden off all, all the edges and ridges and created a really a high rapid water flow that can be ultimately more erosive, more destructive, yeah. deliver the water uh, through quickly. And again, you just, it, 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 it always seems to go back to the same thing of, you know, things need to slow down. Um, yeah. You can't, you can't be so, move so fast and be so destructive. And so yeah. whether it's restoring the vegetation, restoring the weirs, trying to naturally slow down the water flows, and, and stabilize the banks with vegetation so that it's not eroding and hopefully not 
Um, obviously, our creek is not feeding into tamales. It's it's yeah. feeding the, San, the 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 Napa River and of course the the San Francisco Bay. But the, it's still very much something that we are conscientious of. Um, yeah, I'm just looking here. There's a there's a lot of good questions for you. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Um, Come on. Best oysters to barbecue. Best oysters to barbecue. So barbecuing oysters is is oysters will shrink as you cook, so that's why we grow some of the bigger ones. So the traditional on the west coast, anyhow, the, the Pacific oyster, which I've talked about, and these are some of the slightly bigger ones. We call them small. So um, that. The, the, the prevailing wisdom back in the day was you couldn't eat them raw in a half shell, but that had a lot to do with the growing techniques. We were one of the, one, the farms that pioneered this sort of slow growth and slowing them down to produce a nice small oyster for the half shell. But um, you just want a bigger oyster. I actually tend to think that the Pacific oyster, because it's the most full bodied, is the best for barbecuing. Um, people on the East Coast barbecue those oysters as well, but you want a bigger oyster what we would call a small or a medium because they will shrink up, you know, due to the heat a bit. So. Yep. Well, um, so here's a uh, one that I can probably answer. Do you have to crush the oyster shells to feed them to the chickens? Yes. You got to crush them, break them up. Uh, and it's great for the chickens. Uh, you know, it helps uh, again, uh, chicken, chick, chicken eggs also are high in calcium carbonate. So yeah. that's what helps keep a, a hard, uh, a stable shell for the chickens. So oftentimes you'll see sometimes if chickens are really lacking, you know, the shells start to soften and then you, uh, you have to go out and give them, give them oyster shell. Yeah. And this is a funny one. Is it true that you should only eat oysters in the months that have an R in them and avoid the summer months with O? I was thinking that almost sounds like one of those Saturday night live jokes about the pirates. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. There's 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 some truth in it based on on the way things were, you know, 100 years ago. So the months without R are summer months. So back in the day when before we were farming oysters, when we were only only fishing for oysters, there were several reasons not to eat oysters in the summer months. One was that you were pulling them out as they were getting ready to, to reproduce and create young for the next year. Um, also, much like any plant transplanting a, a, a tree or a flower or something in the summertime is not good. So the shelf life would not be good for those oysters. They, they, they don't last as long out of the water because uh, the, the water they're coming from water, water warmer temperature, there's more susceptible to stress. Uh, warmer water can also harbor more bacteria and warmer air can harbor more bacteria. So this is before refrigeration. So for all those reasons, it used to be something you would pay attention to. Um, Nowadays, because A, we've got refrigeration, our farming techniques, as I mentioned, we have four different places in the Bay. We can always find good oysters at any time of the year. Um, it does get a little bit harder in the summertime to source good oysters from all over the place. So for instance, back in the day when we used to sell all around the country before we had our own restaurants, we didn't ship oysters in the summertime because of the shelf life thing and because of, of the chain of custody was so much more important. So it's a little bit harder, but it's not a, an absolute where you can't find good oysters in the summertime. Um, we do things at our farm where everything goes into our filtered seawater system. We chill the seawater down. So if you're coming and getting oysters from us, they're already pre-chilled, really well taken care of. Um, and so we do our best to make sure we have good oysters all year long. That, that brings us to one other question was uh, best temperature to serve uh, your oysters and also the Sauvignon Blanc. So I'll let you and answer the first part of that. Well, it depends. You know, if you're French, you would have your oysters a little bit colder than we would. And the same with wine, I would imagine. They don't like chilling things down because they think it, it sort of defeats the, the flavor. I've been to places in France where you can walk by oyster booths and the oysters are, are not on ice for like hours at a time. Not the greatest thing, I, I believe, <laughs> for that. So... Um, <laughs> You know, we, we chill them down. I mean, you don't want them super cold, but you want, you know, on ice, uh, you know, that, that sort of 38 to 40 degree um, uh, range, I, I think makes for a really nice oyster. Um, and then you can take it from there on the wine, so. Yeah, well, I, 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 I always struggle with that question because ultimately, uh, yeah, everybody likes it. And, and the, you know, there's, there's, there's a moment where, yeah, you love a crisp wine on a summer month. And at the same time, a little warmer temperatures, uh, depending on time of year is great. And yes, I love how wines 
open up and evolve uh, for me in a glass. And so the real luxury is to start it cold and see just, you know, the laser acidity of them. Yeah. Watch it, watch it really cut through, you know, it usually shows more minerality, acidity, cold. And then as it warms up is when the aromatics start to pop, the yeah. texture starts to expand and, and you realize the complexities. And then if you can sit on it for a day, it, it again evolves uh, from there, which I'm guessing we probably don't save a shot or oyster for a day. Yeah, yeah. When you're talking about raw animal protein, it's probably not the best thing. So Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, um, yeah, people, people just keep coming with that. They wanted wow. to confirm, I think you had said earlier, but uh, just confirm the oysters that did come in the kit that was sent out. Those are just the... the, the, the our hog on sweet water. So that's our, our mainstay where we've been growing. And everybody, like I said, everybody on the West Coast grows this variety of oyster. Yeah. This is just our version of it. So everybody grows Pacific oysters. They were brought over from Japan in the 1920s and it's sort of the mainstay. It's actually the most wildly cultured oyster in the world now. So, Awesome. And then they're asking if you have any other secrets for uh, additional uses for the hogwash mignonette. Well, I've, I've seen people do a salad dressing. I've, I've, I've seen people do it as marinade for, especially for things like chicken. Um, it really is a pretty versatile thing that we've created. So um, yep, those are, those are the two that come to mind for me. So. Cool. And then the one final question as we wrap it up, because it might give us a little bit uh, more, more to, to get our teeth on is, you know, talking about the, the overall water quality of the Tamales Bay and, and, and really part of your site selection. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, Tamales Bay is a very interesting place. You know, the nickname for Tamales Bay is Earthquake Bay. So <laughs> if anybody's been out to Marshall to our site, um, we are, we are on, on the North American plate looking across at the Pacific plate. So it's, it's that fault line that really is placed between two places. So it makes for some interesting miroir, I think, because as I mentioned, the runoff from the land is different. Um, it is a very clean bay and, and a very healthy bay, something we are very invested in. We spend a lot of time on, on different watershed councils, making sure that streams are taken care of. I mean, it has really good for the, especially the north end of the bay, has really good exchange with the ocean and the area of the ocean that has a lot of upwelling and a lot of really high productivity. So that's what makes it such a great place to grow oysters. So, um, yeah. Cool. And, and, and I'll just finish by a last little bit, you know, very, very similar. We, I feel, I feel blessed to, to work here uh, at Spotswood because yeah, the, the good fortune for, for the family to stumble on a place uh, that is really a, a great uh, idyllic uh, growing area where we, we are, we are right at the, you know, that transition off the Mayakamas right into the valley floor. So we've got that, that Napa Valley bench that just naturally has some of the best soils in the valley. We're, we're at this convergence of two seasonal streams that creates just a, a wealth of complexity. And, and I always like to, to think that that combined with obviously, um, you know, our efforts to, to, to farm organically, to, to nurture um, everything in our soils and in our little ecosystem that we uh, we work with and control so intimately here yeah it's, it's interesting we, 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 we always we always talk about so i'm a biologist and a, and a, and a fly fisherman and, and it's always about edge the edge habitat is always where where things are really cooking where, where things are really interesting so Yep, and it's that it's that complexity and uh, and those efforts and that uh, contribute to to what everybody's uh, been able to enjoy today. So I think uh, I think that should be pretty close to wrapping us up. Yeah, well, I, I I just suggest it looks like there's a lot of questions that came through that that um, you know people could reach out to us at Hog Island yep. about that. We are trying that you know this pen as this pandemic's hopefully. We're starting to see the backside. We're going to kind of restart up our tour program out at the farm, awesome. you know, and trying to get people out there to teach them more about what we do. And and uh, and it's just great to see this much interest. I really, really appreciate it. Cool. Well, we uh, we appreciate uh, you taking the time to join us, John. And uh, yeah, again, kudos to to everything you and Hog Island have done. And uh, yeah, may may, may let's continue to uh, to benefit the world. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you all for, for being part of this and, and uh, really appreciate the support through all this. So, yep. Thanks for everybody uh, joining. Mm, hope you all have a great evening. All right. Bye, everybody.